Macquarie Island is a special place for a number of reasons. The primary one on the face of it is its World Heritage listing, um, but the World Heritage listing reflects geological values, uh, but also its, its outstanding uh, scenic and natural values. There's no doubt that Macquarie is a, a mecca for birds because uh, all of those species uh, that roam the Southern Ocean uh, need to find somewhere to breed and, and the, there's not many places where they can do so and there are even fewer pest-free places where they can do so. Macquarie Island's an island about uh, 12,800 hectares. It's roughly 34 kilometres in length and width varies from three to five kilometres. It's about 1,500 kilometres uh, southeast of Tasmania, which it is part of. Macquarie Island was discovered by sealers in 1810 in July. They brought with them cats and dogs, probably mice in that uh, early stage as well. From about the 1860s on, they introduced rabbits and weka as a food source. Ship rats also came ashore. Weka were eradicated by 1989 and cats eradicated by 2000, but rabbits, ship rats and mice continued to thrive. Rats and mice are quite insidious because it's not so much the their impacts are not gauged by what you do see, it's what you don't see. And in the case of Macquarie, what you don't see is large flocks of seabirds, uh, particularly burrowing petrels. Rabbits have a, a range of impacts. The first and most visible one is grazing of vegetation. They will graze uh, in a very localised area and graze it very heavily until the vegetation is almost removed. You see patches of bare dirt, you see patches of short grass or, or lichen, large areas where there are standing dead hummocks uh, that used to be tussock grass. So you essentially look out and see a scene of, of relative devastation. From the 1950s onward, there are a number of attempts to control rabbits, including the, the introduction of the myxoma virus in the late 70s. Had a, a great effect on reducing rabbit numbers, but by the late 90s, uh, rabbit numbers were on the increase again. We estimated that the rabbit population on Macquarie Island was somewhere between 125 and 175,000 rabbits. Campbell Island had Norway rats eradicated in 2001. It was a real impetus for for um, the, the sort of feasibility to, be, feasibility to be examined for Macquarie Island and the acknowledgement that if you were going to do um, a, an eradication exercise on Macquarie, uh, you really need to target all three remaining species. The planning phase of the project took several years and, and essentially it was about a couple of main things. One was uh, working out and applying for and, and obtaining all of the regulatory uh, requirements that we had in terms of approvals and permits uh, and the other was a, a very complex logistics exercise where we needed to identify all the things that we needed on the island to, to make the operation work and make sure we had those bought in the right sequence with the goal of having them all ready for the date that the, that the ship was departing Hobart. Of course, once you're on Macquarie Island, you can't go back for anything that you've forgotten so it was really important that we had thought through everything in, in, uh, in a lot of detail. The bait was manufactured in New Zealand, trucked to, uh, to a port and, and uh, shipped to Australia. When it arrived in Hobart, we unloaded the containers that it was in and, uh, and had to pack it into our bait pods, which we had made especially. And we had 436 of those. That total shipment of bait that we brought down in 2010 was 305 tonnes. The bait that we used was a, a product called Pestoff 20R and it contains Brodificum as its active ingredient and it had a, a proven track record and it had been successfully used on Campbell Island to eradicate uh, Norway rats.
Once we arrived, we needed to set up our baiting depots. In our planning work, we had identified three sites for that. Uh, the isthmus at the northern end of the island was one. Green Gorge, uh, which was a spot halfway up the eastern coast of the island, uh, where there was a, a suitable terrace for us to work from. And finally, down at Heard Point on the southeast corner of the island, in the, in the middle of an empty royal penguin colony, uh, was the third site. The challenges that we faced were, were often around weather. First thing in the morning, uh, if we were hoping to fly, we'd, we looked at the weather forecast and the things we were looking for were primarily um, any indication of cloud, uh, because if the plateau was covered in cloud, which it often is, uh, we can't fly in it. We need to spread bait in winds under 25 knots, or 25 knots or less. Uh, greater than that, and we risk the bait curtain being, being blown off course and leaving gaps in our coverage. When we started the planning, it had been uh, predicated on the aerial baiting being done in the winter of 2010. As it turned out, uh, we had some really extended periods of bad weather. Due to the weather, we, we got very little baiting done. We baited 10% of the island um, in the course of seven weeks. We were starting to, uh, to look down the barrel of spring and uh, the return of bird species, so the decision was made to cease baiting and, and withdraw. So it wasn't until uh, mid-November 2010 that we were given the, the go-ahead to return um, to have, have another crack at it in 2011. The first thing we did was we had a, a training exercise for the loading teams, uh, many of whom hadn't done this sort of work before. We followed that up with a small baiting exercise, a dry run if you like, on uh, North Head and the Isthmus. We actually did the baiting there but it was a chance for everybody to get used to how it worked in practice. We had two bait loading teams, uh, there's a team leader and, and four bait loaders. The bait loaders would work uh, two on top of the bait pods loading bait into the helicopter buckets and the other two were responsible for the empty bags as they were passed down and stowing them so that they were safely out of harm's way and, and uh, not able to blow away in the rotor wash. When we were loading bait off the isthmus, we used the JCB loader with a, uh, a large bucket, which really sped things up a lot. One of the things that makes an eradication possible, especially on this scale, is, uh, is the development of GPS. And, and the application that we use is, is a system developed initially for aerial spraying, where, where accuracy is also really critical, uh, as it is for us. GIS is a um, digital product which allows us to put maps on the screen to be able to see um, spatial information. For control jobs you just have to make sure that the helicopter is roughly flying in the right place and that we get a reasonable amount of bait on the ground. Um, for eradication jobs you need to ensure that the, um, the data is exactly where it should be. If the helicopters are out by 30-40 metres, that's a large distance for rats or mice to actually get the bait. Once those flight lines are generated in the GPS, uh, the pilots um, are allocated a, a line number to start on. They head out uh, to, that, to that line and, and their task is to fly that line as accurately as they can and then they uh, work their way across uh, the, the lines and, uh, until they need to come back for more bait. They've got a lot of things going on. They're looking at the GPS screen to try and uh, make sure that they're online there. They have light bars on the instrument panel which help them uh, determine if they're online or not. At the same time they're, they're looking in the bucket to uh, monitor how much bait is still left and uh, the terrain uh, that they're flying around and, and into and what the weather's doing and, and uh, of course where the other helicopters are as well. All on top of the, the basic requirements for flying the aircraft. 
One of the ways to minimise our risk of failure is to do everything we possibly can to make sure that every pest animal has a chance to access bait. One of the ways we do that is by spreading bait twice and by putting on an application rate that reflects what we expect to happen. So a higher application rate for the first bait drop, which uh, most animals will have access to, and a lower application rate for the second bait drop. We know that, that the rabbit densities are higher just below the escarpment, down towards the coastal area. So we actually put on a higher rate of um, poison in that area. We're um, also sowing the plateau with poison and so it's at a lower rate. We have different discs for different application rates. So if they want more bait put out, we take this disc out, put a one with a bigger hole in, and if they want less bait put out, then we'll put a, a smaller disc in. Takes about 30 seconds to change it, very quick, very easy. There were a couple of specific areas on the island where, where helicopters couldn't penetrate with the bait, which we followed up by hand baiting. Uh, we've been baiting the buildings um, to make sure that, that any rats or mice that live inside the buildings or under the buildings have access to bait. So we've been putting out containers, each, each container has got 10 individual baits in it so that we can go back and check if the bait's been taken. The success of the baiting is a difficult one to gauge. You expect to find dead target animals around about four to five days after you first bait an area, which we did. The critical question is how many of the target animals we're getting and that's a really hard one to, to, to gauge. In our case, we found that two weeks after the whole island had been baited the first time, we saw virtually no rabbits. We saw no rats at all. We did see a couple of mice, but then we did the second bait drop as well. There were a number of safeguards that we took to ensure that we didn't impact native wildlife, and, and we tried to minimise that as much as possible. So there's two ways that the planning of the operation um, goes to try and minimise the risk to non-target species. The first one is by timing it. So by doing it in the winter when the skewers are at sea, uh, there's not the chicks to be fed so birds hopefully aren't as susceptible to the baiting. And the second one is by minimising the, the, the time gap that, that poison is available to them. So we're trying to get the bait out as quickly as possible. So that means the bait isn't available as long for both poisoning and then consequently for the secondary poisoning of the, of the scavengers and, and uh, predators. Uh, as well as everybody in the station keeping an eye out for, for anything that they find that may be sick or dead, we've been doing regular beats around all the coastline and that looking for both target and non-target species and collecting them so we can then analyse them for any bait. What's happening is the helicopters are going to drop bait around the albatross, the albatross chicks, and um, just in case they have an interest in the baits, we'll remove the um, bait that's spread from the location of the nest, out to five metres. And then um, just because a mouse's home range can be within two metres, um, we're going to put in these little um, bait um, pods, and so with, which will have bait in them that are tied down, which aren't accessible by the albatross, but if there's any rodents in the area and they want to go in and get that bait, um, that'll work out well. And um, Then the albatross is safe and we'll get any rodents that are living in the area. We know that penguins uh, can be susceptible to disturbance, and so we've done some trials prior to the, uh, the eradication operation to make sure that there was no adverse impacts, all of those overflights were filmed and uh, there was an observer there with a radio. Our primary strategy, uh, and as it turned out, the most successful one for reducing the impact was introducing Khaleesi virus to the Macquarie Island rabbit population in uh, February of 2011, about four months before we expected to start baiting. 
that uh, reduced the rabbit population by a huge amount, which was exactly what we were trying to achieve because the, the strategy was based on um, having far fewer rabbits left to bait um, so that there were fewer toxic carcasses left available for scavenging birds. Despite the mitigation measures that we employed to reduce uh, non-target mortality, that still occurred. We had to remind ourselves that the project had long-term gains and the long-term benefits to the island from the removal of rabbits and rodents would far outweigh the short-term impacts on target mortality. Having helicopters on Macquarie doesn't happen that often and so we, were, we had a number of things that we needed to do while they were here. Probably the most uh, important was establishment of five field huts. The hunters that we have on the island searching for rabbits obviously need somewhere to live. There were five existing huts in Macquarie that were put in by the Antarctic Division and we supplemented those with five additional huts. We knew that with nearly all the rabbits dead, the vegetation would start to grow back and come spring, uh, surviving rabbits would start to breed again. So if we were to have any chance of success with eradicating rabbits, we needed to, to have enough resources in terms of hunters to really put pressure on the survivors. To that end, we looked at a team of 15 hunters for the first year. We'll drop that down a little bit later on. This year uh, the, the current hunting team uh, will be here for nine months uh, following on from the aerial baiting when the, when the baiting team departed. Subsequently we'll be back to 12 month rotations uh, from April next year. To ensure that our pressure that we put on the surviving rabbit population is fairly evenly spread, we divided the island into six hunting blocks. Now the island's nearly 13,000 hectares so on average that meant that each hunting block was um, a bit over. 2000. But each hunting block has two huts, so the staff uh, are allocated to spend a month in each block and there are two staff in each block, including a, a dog handler, uh, searching systematically for any sign of rabbits that might have survived the aerial baiting. So each day we look at the land and we try and we want to cover as much ground as possible and as thoroughly as possible to find any rabbit sign. That could be all manner of things, droppings, scratchings, grazing, anything we can see. And, and it's a big island when you have to do it on foot. This is sign, this is uh, um, where he's been feeding, it's territory. We're looking for needles in haystacks now because they've had um, the Khaleesi virus gone through, they've had a bit of mixo before that, plus also the poisoning. So there's just the odd one or two rabbits left behind. The most successful hunting techniques really is uh, the hunters engaging their, all of their senses. The first thing they, they really need to be doing is using their eyes. Part of that is thinking, OK, what's likely to be good rabbit habitat and, uh, and making sure that's covered thoroughly. Then they need to be alert and diligent enough to be looking really closely for any signs of a single rabbit dropping or a little bit of grazing or, or a bit of scraping. And on a large island, that's a, that's a real challenge. We carry all our hunting equipment with us, which includes traps, guns, poisons. We have got anything on hand available um, in our packs that we carry with us so that we can address any situation, any rabbit situation as it arises. We go spotlighting whenever the weather's suitable. Tonight's a bit marginal, but you've got to get out there to see if they're about. They don't sort of choose when they come out. Um, and we're spotlighting areas that are known to have had a lot of rabbits in the past. Um, we spotlight the whole island, but there's obviously areas which are more productive for rabbits than, than others. So tonight I'm targeting an area which has had a uh, heap of rabbits in the past. Now one uh, really important weapon is the dogs. The hunting team on Macquarie has six dog handlers. We currently have 12 dogs in the team. We selected um, 
Springer Spaniels and Labradors as the breeds that we wanted for Macquarie Island, partly because they could cope with the, the cold, wet conditions, partly because they have a strong hunting drive, and partly because they're amenable, more than many breeds, to working for different handlers, which is a prerequisite for us because we'll be changing them annually. There's a number of types of terrain on Macquarie Island and uh, they all bring their own challenges. Probably the easiest to get around on is the, is the plateau and offers good visibility when it's not covered in cloud. The coastal slopes vary. Some of them are, uh, are quite straightforward and easy to get around on. Other sections of the coastal slopes are far more broken and serrated and rugged and some of them are very difficult to access. The coast offers challenges in a number of areas. Most of the coastal area is, is cobblestone beach, which can be quite tiring to walk on. There are areas of, of headlands where a lot of scrambling is needed to get around and, and some rocky areas which need negotiating. The northwest corner of the island has a feature known as the feather bed, which is a, a quaking bog, a thin layer of turf over several metres of uh, sludge and, and water. It's not unusual for people to, uh, to puncture that uh, layer of turf and, and go in up to the, to the waist sometimes in, in the feather bed, which can be quite um, time consuming to extract yourself from. The work routine for the hunters is based on, on them uh, being rostered into hunting blocks for a month at a time. In terms of the hours that hunters work in the field, it's really up to them and the conditions that they find. There's the sort of basic eight hour uh, expectation, but some days it's considerably less and some days it's considerably more. The rotation at the moment, the hunters are in the field for 27 days of the month and back for four days on base. Uh, so every, uh, towards the end of the month they come in um, and we have a meeting just to talk about debrief how the uh, month's gone. As eradication team leader I generally do a round of the hunters about every fortnight, uh, during which I'll walk around the island um, visiting the hunters in their huts and uh, downloading their data from their GPSs. Uh, the data is primarily uh, from the GPSs, on the GPSs which records their tracks so you can see where they've been and also um, they put any sign or kills on as waypoints so they can be downloaded and put onto a map so you can see where we're killing rabbits or where we're getting sign. The numbers currently in month three we've got seven rabbits confirmed killed um, which is extremely low numbers. So the combination of the baiting, the RCD and myxomatosis has been very successful in decimating the population. This is a long term project. We anticipate a couple of years of hunting yet to account for the surviving rabbits uh, and then a couple of years after that before we'll declare the project successful. We'll bring rodent dogs down in a couple of years to check for rodents but again we, we don't really expect to have a clear success possibly for another five years from the commencement of the hunting phase. The rewards that will accrue to the island are immense. Long term we expect to see strong recovery in vegetation. We expect to see strong recovery in uh, invertebrates and particularly we expect to see strong recovery in, uh, in the burrowing petrel populations on the island. And of course there's always the possibility of uh, considering the reintroduction of closely related species that have been lost from the quarry.